Do you want me to answer, or do you want to take a little clarify? Why don't we take three questions, and then you can deal with all three. Okay. So. Um, <clears throat> if you, you talk about, about, winning, about winning, strategy is to win. Right. If we won in the next five years the climate change battle, how would we know? What would, win, what would winning right. look like? Okay. Okay. And the third one. Clarification. So you say it's not consumption, it's markets, but consumption is a big piece of the market, so it just seems to like you actually tease it. <coughs> Can you, I, I don't quite get how you, so consumption market, means market. You say it's not consumption, it's the market that we need to change. Okay. Uh, but a lot of the market is driven by the consumption, so I, right. I, it's just like I'm used to being a okay. side of the Right, right, okay. So just tease it. Let me, let me go in okay. reverse order because I remember better. So, so that's just consumption. Consumption is kind of a myopic lens because when we start thinking about consumers, it's we abstract from markets. We treat, we sort of look at consumption across from the con consumer, you know, their household and the stuff we consume, and we sort it in different ways. But when you look at it, so consumption is part of a market. So when you study a market, so one of the dimensions, one of the angles by which I studied bottled water was the consumer lens. But if I didn't study the whole construction of the market and the way all the other actors were involved, I couldn't explain it. So, so instead of supply and demand, it's the market as it's constructed, and it's not only economic actors, not just the businesses and consumers, but there's lots of other uh, important actors, the media, the NGOs, um, public goods investment. There's a lot of pieces coming together that a typical economic analysis wouldn't, wouldn't get you, but a typical consumer analysis would totally miss the boat as well. Um, so what would we get if we won? Well, first, the, the nice thing about parsing things out, it might be over simplistic, but at least allows you to see what the, what the what victory would look like. So first victory, if we put, if we had a $200, first getting a $200 price on, uh, per ton price on carbon and refunding it all to Americans per capita in a progressive way would be huge. I mean, it would be, it would be, it would get, it's a game changing, um, win that you would see trickle out across every issue that you're worried about. Doesn't reduce sea level rise, doesn't change temperature, doesn't change precipitation levels, doesn't reduce the cost of adaptation anywhere in any coastal sure. place, any time in our lifetime. You, you come up with a better single solution that would have that's more impact. That's a good question. No, so, so it, would have, it would have a radical change on energy production and consumption. Radical. Every model that I've looked at suggests that our the, the greenhouse forcing gases would decline precipitously with this. It wouldn't hit, would it hit 80% or 90% by 2050? No, but it might hit, just with that change, it might hit 50%. So without that, what, you know, if you accept that reducing greenhouse gas emissions along the lines that the IPCC and everybody else talks about is absolutely crucial, to the rising of the oceans, everything else. I mean, we we might be past that point. We might be hitting tipping point. It's already. We don't know. So it's we're playing. It's a probabilistic approach. That's all we have at this point. Um, so that would be a huge win, and we would see huge transformations across every sector. Tran transportation would change. Housing would change. Everything. I mean, you know, unless you don't believe in sort of you know basic economic principles that pricing matters to people, and they change their behavior and pricing matters in the market and so you know if all of a sudden tar sands uh, oil costs $150 to produce instead of the 90 today they're gonna have a lot more trouble making business there and they'll probably shut down and we'll have to find a different solution so those that's to me is a huge huge win and then 
Below that, within each market, if you're worried about oceans, it's certainly not just the rise of oceans, but it's acidification, it's fishing, it's, there's all sorts of issues that are particular oceans. There's lots of people who are working just concerned with that and what's sustainable aquaculture and so forth. There's a whole kind of market analysis, just what I did for bottled water, for oceans, for transport, for each of these areas. For, I'm very interested now in, in, you know, in farming and, 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 uh, and livestock, because there's such great research about soil carbon now is one of, you know, that I put that together with uh, a carbon tax as the two most critical policies that we need to pursue. How do you do that? This isn't going to get us there. We need a, some very focused work to be done on farming and ranching to figure out how to rapidly incentivize um, you know, soil carbon promoting agriculture. So there's a lot of things to be done, but that would be the first one. And in each market, you would have targets. So we want to raise soil carbon from 1% to 3% in 50% of the land in 10 years. How do we do that? So you can have an absolute specific goal that you know is going to have a huge impact and develop a specific strategy to do that. Uh, last question. So, um, yeah, so it'd be, this would be like a four-hour talk instead of a, whatever, less than an hour one if we went through this. But I spent some time looking, you know, so this is what happens in commerce. But I would argue that one of, you know, one of the reasons that, um, you know, the, the big right-wing foundations and this whole infrastructure they built has succeeded so well in the last 30, 40 years is because they use a lot of the best expertise from you know, the business world and frameworks to, to do this. They, you know, it's a, it needs to be adapted. It's not selling Pepsi is different than um, convincing all Americans that they should shut down government. But the tool, the toolkit is similar and the expertise is similar. So if you look through, you know, look through the history of this, one can, and it's a very culturalist approach that they take. So it's very similar to the kinds of model, cultural banding model that I've worked with, I think, you know, I learned a lot from what Ronald Reagan did. I mean, I learned a lot from looking at civil rights, right? you know. So we tend to just look at um, progressive movements for, you know, for, for models. But really, the most successful movement in the last 40 years is the right. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, so there's, they did do that, I think, and, you know, there's another book to be written. There's lots of primary research that's hard to access to document that. But a lot of people have written about the you know, the conservative movement that you can interpret from this kind of lens. Why don't we just open it up to more general comments. So I have Julie, and so I have the two people there. Okay. So I know you've spent a lot of time thinking about the sort of <coughs> cultural messaging around climate, mm -hmm. and I'm, I know you're arguing for the specific market approach, but I, I'm just kind of curious what your current thinking is on sort of how to message on that. Mm -hmm. And the sort of related question is, do you think that the right has so kind of tainted and the the idea of government that it's? I mean, what are you thinking about that in right. terms of a, a successful progressive messaging around government? Right. So, for climate, it's not looking by market. It's treating that whole. So it's it's a movement. It's the same kind of analysis, but we need to look at think of climate as a brand. Mm -hmm study how its genealogy, look at how it's developed since James Hansen was in Congress in 1988, and the counterbrand which formed coming out of Rio, and as it started you know, being a reasonable policy that uh, might find its way into government, the BTU tax and that whole debacle, Kyoto, that whole debacle, cap and trade, that whole debacle, there's a, a genealogy of the branding, counterbranding that one can study using the approach that I take. So that's the first piece. Then you want to look at, OK, where does that brand sit today? And how is it, how is it understood? And how, how does it resonate, brand, counter brand, across the American public today? And it's obviously not uniform. So then you get classic marketing. You segment. We don't segment by green attitudes. That's you know, it's interesting, but it's too vague. We want to segment by what is the climate brand? So my segmentation, I've got seven segments. The climate brand exists in different ways. You've got this battle that's kind of you know, stalled out because we're not, there's no push for, behind the climate brand right now, uh, despite you know, the march and stuff. But once it gets hot again, once it gets, you know, if, there, if it gets, looks like it could, uh, could be uh, uh, you know, an interesting uh, um, policy that, that uh, Democrats could get behind, 
then it will heat up again. It's probably going to heat up again anyway, though, because the because we were so ineffective branding climate to get to Europe. There's sort of two key components. The the right has used climate as this kind of political football, and they made it into this hugely partisan issue that's done brilliant work for them, rallying the the hardcore and really helps on elections. They won 2010. A lot of people blame climate for what's happened there. It's still a powerful tool. It's a powerful tool in, in uh, Colorado and other states this last election. So it's still this very, um, um, you know, you have to look at the counterbrand very carefully. And and then you need, and so to the progressive piece is, or the, um, excuse me, the populist piece is really important. So one of the key failures for cap and trade is that it didn't recognize the political lay of the land, which is we're in the middle of this huge right populist, you know, the, the blaming of problems, pointing at government while the right is collapsing government at the same time. So, you know, Tom Frank's Wrecking Crew and other books document. And that in, you know, there's 20, 30 percent of the population doesn't believe it, but in the mass sort of Main Street and right, that's kind of the working political model of our system and we need to take the government back and the Tea Party is kind of the fringe, but that sentiment is everywhere. So launching new big government programs becomes absolutely deadly, which is why Obamacare has become another football, why single payer can never get on the table. So a strategy has to be around, it has to be populist. We have to make climate policy a populist idea. That's the basic, and so that's, you know, when you do the analysis, it's like, oh, that's absolutely a key issue, and there's about five or six of those, that if you're gonna have a good climate strategy, I've got to go to Main Street and they've got to go, damn right I want that. So what, how are you going to do that? I mean, that, you know, that, and that's obvious, I think. I mean, it's like, gosh, you know, that, I mean, because you look at how, how they've been just slammed anybody who's sort of in a, in a battleground state with that rhetoric and they're coming to tax you and they're socialists, you know you have to answer that and have not just a rebuttal but something that's appealing that's better than what they're saying and more believable. Um, and it's a huge challenge, but that's, you know, so the ideas that I'm working with are trying to sort of answer, you know, address that okay, question. Two questions down here. Why don't we take those two questions and then you can deal with them. <coughs> uh, thank you very much. It's great. I enjoyed reading also your article. And I don't have much of a background, but I feel good about it. as both and now having a class in social marketing. <laughs> because we all don't like marketing, but it has a major role to play. Yeah. Um, just one quick clarification in relating to that question. So for the bottle of water, I have a hard time believing that we're not seeing the numbers go down. Is the statistic from the United States or global? Because interestingly, all those health concerns which were up with the bottle of water now seem to move people away to this kind of bottles. Yeah, so, right. Uh, I mean, plast pl plastic, BPA, and everything. So yeah. I'm like still <laughs> right. puzzled that right. we haven't seen it right. down. But would you say that once we clarify the strategy and the marketing message, and again, bottle water is so much simpler to climate change, right. would you say we should work with the same actors who brought the wrong message to kind of redesign the message, you know, bring back the environmental working group, you know, other NGOs sure. and the media, and just raise the message and should, I mean. Yeah, I mean, I think there's, that's okay, great. So, oh, sorry. Let's get to two questions. Okay, I'm sorry. Yep. Oh, yeah, my question. Yeah. Um, and thanks for the presentation, first of all. Uh, just uh, <coughs> wondering about, uh, is this sort of the use of the dark arts, like ironically um, purposeful? Because I'm, I'm, like, like you said, uh, a lot of the people in the trenches like, are hostile towards marketing. Mm -hmm. So uh, kind of like copying from the playbook, because like the, the, the whole polarization that we won't do anything that the other tribe is doing might be kind of like uh, a barrier in itself to adopting this. So is, is this kind of like a preemptive way of, you know? I like, actually take it because I did something for Square and uh, Eugene. And somebody said, oh, so you're somebody. On, and Eugene said, oh, you're bringing in the dark arts. I thought, as a joke. I thought, uh -huh. that's, <laughs> but that's a good, but it, yeah, it's preemptive to, you know, because that's the way a lot of people think. Some, some kind of understand it, but are ugh, a little squeamish to being very, that's not authentic. That's you know we're we're kind of manipulating people, and that's not what our movement's about. So there's all sorts. So it's just you know I could could use different language, but I think it's just let's just accept it for what it is. It's a technology. It's you know companies that you really admire use marketing. Um, NGOs use marketing. You know, so everybody's using marketing. So let's get over it and do it. If we're going to do it, let's do it well. And I think everybody who actually does this knows that they do marketing. But you know Saul Linsky is marketing. 
Um, but they don't want to, you know, it shouldn't come from a marketeer, it should come from a Solvinsky. I think it's a spokesperson too, there's some issues there. Um, on, the, on the first question, though, I thought, that, I mean, that's great. See, this is exactly what a good analysis should be very productive for in novel and more powerful mm -hmm. solutions. So the two I put up are just two, you know, two examples. You'd actually want to concept test them, trial them. So you came up with two more. One, when I put this together originally, BPA hadn't blown up. It has, so what a great strategy is to say, I don't know what, you know, BPA and PET, but I, there's certainly lots of stories about, you know, leaving your bottle in your car and it's leaching and stuff. So let's just run with that. It's, you know, that's the new scare. And that actually, and really focus on bottled water and run a PSA campaign, perfect. Let's go to environmental working group in NRDC and say, look, you, I know you guys have the best intentions, but you look what your reports are doing. Let's have a new, you know, these are all, and there's probably, you know, five other strategies, and they're all different than take back the tap, and they would all be work better. Um, so that's, the, that's exactly the point, is that you see the strategy, it's so all of a sudden, ah, I know where I want to go at it. I have some other ideas. So it's very productive that way. Okay, so let's get um, Elena, James, and do I have a third for this round? I have another question, so... Oh, and Paul, okay. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to give people right, okay. first round. Okay. It's a oh, uh, so if I understand your paper, you, your recommendation in the end is that you have to take each of those manifestations of unsustainable consumption on its own, study, study how that market emerged, and then look for leverage points. And you point that... Yeah. But I, I just can't imagine that, that we can actually implement something like that. The markets are going to always, new markets are going to emerge. That's the nature of our economy and those who are in power, who, right, and the companies that want us to, to be attracted to more things and consume them, right? So we cannot <laughs> keep up. I mean, you, you're going to study one market and find leverage points to reduce that, that activity, and then there will be another one, and another one, and another. This is not a game that can be won through campaigns. Mm -hmm. so I think that what we need is to, to move at a higher level of aggregation. Mm -hmm. right? the, the, the whole, why do we towards the concept of sufficiency? How would that fit your model? That would be a big idea that needs a strategy. <laughs> but, but I am asking for the strategy oh, you want another, for this you want big yeah, idea. Yeah. Get a couple more question. on the board there. Maybe yeah, okay. synergy. Sure, 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 sure. Yeah. 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 Mine actually follows from Alina's, but um, I'm going to step back for a moment. Um, your highest level analysis, mm -hmm. I kind of agree with, that there's a big gap between macro and micro, and it's, and it's um, uh, uh, um, addressing that gap that has been missing um, uh, on the left and climate and everything else. Um, however, and there's a big however for me, um, <coughs> the systems that you talk about are individual markets. Mm -hmm. um, and you haven't talked about the, um, uh, the market system as a whole and that all these um, products and markets are very much related and embedded in a larger system. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if your assumption is if you um, uh, address enough of these individual markets, you somehow transform the system or not, but it doesn't appear that way. Um, and the idea that doing this approach um, in five or ten years is going to be transformational seems extremely unlikely um, uh, to me. Um, and uh, uh, the unintended consequences assumption, um, I don't think it's unintended at all. Uh, I think it is built into our system, uh, uh, advanced capitalism. Um, there are externalities. They are well known to corporations and, uh, and, and um, the uh, left. And I think it's, it, it, it's a, a mischaracterization that somehow this market has, has gone awry. It's endemic, in mm -hmm. my, my view. Mm -hmm. um, I do hope you'll return to Julie's point. Um, and, and I would um, raise the specific question of how do you get to $200 carbon um, uh, price per, per ton or, or um, 
fact, I think many w w would uh, agree with you, it seems extremely difficult, and I don't see a, a strategy for that. Right. Let's round this out with Paul, and then you can respond. Well, I mean, the previous question sort of stole my thunder. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> and big time synergies. So, um, so I've lived long enough to see Talos Institute uh, <clears throat> appear on a list of people label the uh, liberal left. So I think we may be losing our mojo here. <laughs> <laughs> or another way of putting that is that when you think about strategy, I think you need to think about what your goals are. And you weren't really clear about that. Mm -hmm. So you can have near-term goals and long-term goals. You can have reformist goals, pointless goals, or you could have systemic goals. <clears throat> you dismiss the macro uh, by saying take 100 years no, 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 I didn't dismiss the macro. Well, yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll be clear on, I do, dismissed one kind okay, of macro yeah, strategy. Take it back. Take it back. <laughs> but the point is, is that, you know, uh, the, 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 the question of systemic change raises very different issues about what strategy needs, what leverage points are, how, how you do change with your audiences and all of that. Not to disagree with your points about the bottle bill and all of that, but I think, you know, you have to, I think it, it's important to have clarity on the way all of these different dimensions <coughs> of this whole larger uh, transformation need to work together. And that discussion we haven't had yet. Right. Uh, but, uh, but I think that's the one to have, the handshake between working at these different levels of uh, the this, this systemic uh, strategy and, and the reformist strategy. Okay, three questions that have some connection, but also some right. breath to them. You're gonna have to, uh, you're taking notes, so. Let me, let me start here because I still have this one in mind and I'll work okay. back, see if I can remember. But yeah, I mean, Matt, for, so the macro, just to clarify, I'm working on the macro level as I'm conceiving it. So let me talk about, so you, you guys are thinking of macro in a, through a different lens. So from my standpoint, macro is, I'm very instrumental and pragmatic. What can we do about you know, greenhouse gas and the key overshoot issues that we have today? In the you know in the most effective, efficient way, given that we're going to be in crisis mode in 20 years. So for me, saying you know 10 years, 20 years, that's the time we have. So that's we don't have a choice about the goal. It has to be our goal. So given the time frame we have, how do we approach it? May not work, but what's the best? If we're going to be strategic, where are we going to invest our ideas, resources, energy, solidarity, etc.? So that's. The, the, the focus, and I've got a 150 page strategy document on cultural political strategy to drive a $200 ton tax. I don't know if it'll work, but I know it's a heck of a lot better than anything that's out there today, being very modest and so forth. But no, we just have, we haven't tried, you know. We let the inside cabal, inside the Beltway cabal, try and pass a really crappy bill in 2008-9, and it didn't work. And then we've given up on what's most important. <laughs> so. So yes, so that's so that when I think of macro, that's what I think about. Why? Because uh, neoliberal capitalism is, you know, we to do to get where you are talking about. It's not system change; it's revolution. And I don't see a revolution coming. I don't see any change. You know, we will get to a crisis, as you know, a number of futurist scenarios have have pulled. You know, maybe by 2030, 2050, we will have enough crises induced by climate problems and overshoot problems, water, et cetera, that we'll get there, but that's too late. So, so, my, so the, un, the unpacked assumption underneath it is that we can't sit around and try and do this big system change, which is really kind of a culture change sort of argument underneath, because we don't have time, the revolution will be generated by a crisis. You may argue differently, but I don't see any evidence historically or now to suggest that that's anything but a pipe dream which is why I say, let's create the conditions that that transformation can happen. One is this massive pricing mechanisms. We have that. Right now, we're all handicapped across every dimension, whether you work in transport or agriculture, whatever you want to do, you're deeply handicapped just by the, you know, the externality. We can flip that around, all of a sudden, the decks stack much better to our side, whatever issue you work on, almost across the board. So that's huge. Meso level, there's a bunch of institutional level, you call it market, you call it institutions too. It's a market institutional sort of analysis that you can go after, and we should go after, in addition, the pricing mechanisms is the handicapper. We set the handicap against the incumbents. 
And then we go after the institutions, and then we're also creating new models on the ground. So the, the transformation that I'm interested in for you know, what happens on the other side is not thinking about the big whatever change at some systems level, it's setting the conditions for whatever that's going to be and incubating a lot of those, a lot of experiments on the ground for, for what that can be. So let me try and remember. So back, can you give me a quick I think, I think I'm, the common thread in the two questions was, was really the, the diversity of specific markets right. and the problem of dealing across such a wide yeah. range of markets, particularly when the market is always called right. Oh, problems. Right, and the unintended consequences, which I think yeah. it is. So, yeah, so, I, so I don't, to, to start with Helena and then move across, I don't agree that, I don't think, I, I, I take your point on um, unintended consequences, probably the wrong word. I would say agnostic to the unsustainability as long as the profit streams are still there. I don't think any business is in business to pollute, but they don't, aren't going to take the hit to not pollute. So they, they're aware of it. So unintended consequence, I mean the market develops, they're gonna go after the market, and what I mean by unintended consequence, they're not going to pollute. They're going to build market and it becomes an unintended consequence. So, they're, so if you can construct a market that is, pro, you know, maybe it's not as profitable, but it has incumbents who are profiting. I don't think they need to make just as much money. But if you can lock in a market structure that you've made more sustainable, I don't see, there's nobody coming saying, no, we'd have to make it, you know, less sustainable. The market will evolve, but if you can build the institutions that sustain those key sustainability issues, you know, getting plastic out of how we consume water, and people are making money on whatever that solution is, that we'll have new incumbents who are, you know, I mean, electric cars, there'll be new incumbents with lots of lobbying dollars, and they're, they're gonna wanna hold that market together. So I don't see the inevitability of, oh, this is putting a finger in the dam, and then if you really treat it institutionally and create a new agriculture bill and a new, you know, just a whole new system for agriculture in this country, there's no, you know, it's going to, it's going to be much better for everybody and they're going to see it. And so I think that, you know, I, I, I don't see that inevitability. And I would also say that there's tons of people working at the market level already. So this is just, you know, to say that we can't sl splice up the world, there's maybe, <clears throat> you know, a dozen of these that are super consequential, or 15, or however you splice up. And there's already, you know, NGOs and thousands of people and specialists working on this. So this is actually just providing a, a hopefully a strategy toolkit to help those. It's not, you know, and, and, and resource to go at a more kind of strategic view of these markets, not, um, not something, um, you know, created from scratch. And then there was a point to connect you back to you, Julian, I'm forgetting what that was. <laughs> it was $200 time, but, but, but okay. let's move on. Okay. Yeah. yeah, I think we're at the last round, so I have Alan. I'll take two additional beyond Alan if there are two. We have that one question. Nobody's taking it. That's okay. Yeah. All right, I've got Alan, I've got Robert. Thanks so much. Are there other people who haven't gone yet? Yes. Okay. So, Alan, why don't you read off? Uh, this is a thought about the aggregation problem. Uh, there's 100,000 consumer products out there, mm -hmm. uh, and we, uh, we don't need 100,000 strategies, or if we do, we're in deep, deep trouble, because that's not a 10-year or 20 or 30 year solution, that's a, almost an infinite, infinitely yeah. long solution. So I think asking the question, uh, I'm asking the question, <laughs> right. are there certain transcendent strategies uh, that, that have cover right. parts of the markets that <coughs> on the line that you can say strategy A applies to this, B to that, C to that, where that is a bundle, a very large bundle of certain uh, market or market types that uh, you can uh, piece together, that you can assemble right. and gain some efficiency. So I'm thinking one approach might be Take the five or six basics at the highest level of human needs. What are the shelter markets? What are the food markets? What are the education markets? Uh, what are the uh, mobility markets? And ask the question, are strategies, transcendent strategies possible? And that way we can imagine a 15-year solution instead of a 100-year solution. Yeah, and that, I, I agree I, with I, I, I want to say I'm going to give the other two, and then <laughs> we'll give you the last word. OK. Rob? All right. So um, my question has to do mostly with the issue of power, and you kind of mentioned it a couple times, but I just wonder 
I mean, I think some of the reason that the right has had a lot of success in using marketing is because they have the whole infrastructure and the power and support, sort of the dominant paradigm behind them. We don't necessarily have that. And I mean, to take kind of the battle analogy that you mentioned earlier, there's a reason that small groups don't use the same strategies the U.S. does. You know, ISIS isn't using the same strategy because they don't have the same tools. We don't have that power. Why? So how can we use the tools that, from my perspective, depend on that power without being either completely ineffectual or just co-opted by that power in some way? And, and the final question. Yeah, mine actually um, was very similar to that one. It's just, yeah, how do you suggest who should be doing this work when um, it is time consuming and expensive and there aren't as many resources? So we're going to start there, and then I'll come back back to the first one. Um, so yeah, I, I don't I don't see that as an issue at all. I think these tools aren't. They're they're certainly an institutional issue that there's a bunch of you know huge organizations that are skilled at these. But th these tools aren't. You know they are learnable. It wouldn't take that much money to build a very good crew using these tools, and they're not expensive to deploy. We're not talking about a hundred million dollar ad campaign. So when you say power. You know, it's, I mean, this idea of, uh, you know, we should have different tools, it's exactly the opposite. I mean, go back, you know, to famous cultural Marxists, and they would, you know, t t tell you the opposite. I mean, it's, you know, we need to n know the best tools <laughs> out there and use them to our advantage, um, rather than think that there's, if there are different tools that work, that's fine, but if you go and look at history of you know, any great movement that you admire, not the right maybe, you'll find very smart strategy too. So you know, how that came about, was there a, an explicit sort of strategic framework that I'm describing? No, but can we learn from them in a more strategic way and build that out so we're more systematic about it? Yes. So what I'm describing is no different than really what if you look at you know, the key moments that transpired in the civil rights movement that were just very clever. Um, you know, sending a bunch of college kids down to Mississippi to be side by side as the riots are going on getting on TV. I mean, they're, they're just very, you know, they're very specific decisions that were made that we can systematically learn from and business tools have been the place where those have been systematized so I think we should bring them back. There's no power. There's no power issue at all. There's little companies, little startups that use these same tools. There's no reason small groups can't use these tools. In fact, we're wasting, I would, I would make the opposite argument that we've, the idea has been that we need you know, huge firepower to fight big firepower. That's why Al Gore raised $300 million. That's why Tom Steyer thinks he's the new guy with you know, putting his billions on the table. And we don't need more money, we need more ideas. So these are the right ideas, and if they're sold correctly, you don't need, with social media now, you don't need a ton of money, you just need to do it well. So I, I, I don't agree with, with that point. On the, se on the sector thing, I agree completely, and I, it's probably misleading having bottled water as an example. I use it as an academic case, a theory building case, because it's very easy, it's small and very easy to study. But what I would do is, I mean, slightly different sort of you know, algorithm than you, but I would look at what are, I would divide by markets or institutions, I wouldn't take, I wouldn't start with, you know, what are the human needs, but I would like go out and say, what are these market institutions that have the most dire environmental consequences that if I can turn will make a huge difference on greenhouse gas, on water, on the, you know, the key overshoot issues. And you can map them, and we all know what they are, and there's, you can probably end up with six or eight that will make a difference. And then, you know, once you get into the strategy, you're going to want to make, you're going to want to drill down. And, but I think you can start with agriculture, you can start with housing, you can start with transport. And I think once you get into this kind of analysis, you might, you know, have a couple smaller, you know, you, want to, you might want to make, have more nuanced analyses and, and strategies within. But I think that's where you start. And then it becomes, instead of, you know, 500 strategies and 500, you, you have it, you know, it's a more kind of sane, uh, thing that you can see actually resourcing and organizing behind. So I agree more or less with your point. Okay, well I don't I don't want to have that traditional role assigned to the Federal Reserve of taking away the punch bowl when the party's just getting started. <laughs> so uh, I'm going to close the formal proceedings, but I'm also going to say that Doug has agreed to stay after and answer individual questions if people want to chat for a while.
Thank you.